Hello and welcome to the video. In this video we'll be covering conditionals, functions, scopes, and loops. Oftentimes in the real world we like to compare things. To see whether something is larger than another thing. If, to see if they're the same. Maybe we're trying to get a good deal at a store. Well this is a common thing we'd like to do in programming as well. This is where conditionals come in. Conditionals are a piece of code that evaluate the true or false, or a boolean. We can use these to build complex pieces of logic, or to make sure that certain code only executes upon a condition. There are several different types of conditionals that we can use in our code. First we have equals, which makes sure that the two values are the same. Next we have greater than, which makes sure that one value is larger than the other. Less than which is like greater than except the opposite Let greater than or equals to less than or equals to and not equals. Not equals only returns true if the values aren't the same. You may be noticing this strange syntax here with three equal signs. This is our standard comparison operator for e equals. In weekly type languages, the language will attempt to convert types. This prevents that. This is so that something like the string of one is not equal to the number of one. However, there is syntax to handle it if we do want to compare types. However, there is syntax to handle it if we do want to ignore types. This is simply two equal signs. As you can see here, PHP Storm is warning us that there may be a coercion happening between these types. However, this will return true. We can verify that with console log. We simply run it. As you can see, it console logs out to true. If you're coming directly from the other video, you may need to run it by right-clicking on the file. If we now use the strong equals comparison, it will return false because the type conversion isn't allowed to take place. Once we change the string 1 back to the number of 1, it returns true again. Comparison operators should work on any type. Let's take a look at these in action. Let's say we have two values of price from store A and a price from store B. So 
Say we want to check whether store A has the lowest price. We can use the variable store A and compare it against store B. When we run this code, it returns true. Now we're aware that store A does indeed have the lower price. But this isn't very useful in the current state that it is. We need what is called an if block to get the most out of this code. An if block is what is called a control statement. It is a block of code that allows us to control the flow through our program. To create an if block, we use the if keyword here and then we put a conditional inside the parentheses next to the if. We can also put the result of a conditional. Putting this as highlight on your screen, the comparison between store A and store B inside of the parentheses of the if block is exactly the same as saving it to a variable and then putting the variable within the parentheses. As you can see, we're now console logging that store A has a lower price when store A is lower is true. A console logs out this. However, if we were to change the price to be higher than store B, nothing would display. This is useful. However, what if we want to respond to something else? Say, console log that store B has the lower price. This is where else and else if blocks come in. Now you can see, since store A is less than store B is false, Using the else block, we can console log that store B has a lower price. But there's an issue in our code. What if they are the same? Well, it's still going to say that store B has the lower price, which is clearly false. This is where else if statements come in. Else if statements simply allow us to append comparisons to the if block. But it also needs a new comparison. For the comparison that we're putting in the else if block, we're going to check whether or not store B is less than store A. This should fix our error. And we simply need to add an else to handle the remaining possibilities. In this case, that they are equal. As you can see, it console logs that the prices are equal. If we change store B to be lower, it will console log store B has a lower price. And if A is lower, it will do what we expect. Else will always execute if previous comparisons were false. But now we have a problem. We have all of this code, but if we want to reuse it, we'd have to copy and paste it, and this could get messy. What if we wanted to change what these messages said? We'd have to change them at every place that we copy and pasted them. This could quickly get out of hand, as this code could be used in five places, or even a hundred places, strewn across many, many files. This is why we need functions. 
Functions are ways for us to cap encapsulate our code in a way that is reusable. Visually, it is similar to an if block, except that it is named. Imagine functions like variables that contain code. Functions have two main features, parameters and the code that they execute. Parameters allow us to pass variables into our code. We need this due to scope, which we'll cover in a moment. Passing the parameters also lets us know where these parameters are coming from. In order to run a function, we need to call it by its name, followed by parentheses, and inside of the parentheses, we pass the value. The values are in order. So in this case, for the compare store prices, the first parameter is store A. When we're calling it, store A will be set to 10, store B being set to 5. We can now run this code. As you can see, store B now has a lower price. But we can also call this code multiple times. As you can see, this here is far cleaner than copying and pasting this entire block of code over and over again. Functions can also give us values. Let's create a function that squares a number. To have a function give us a value, we need a return statement. To do this, we use the return keyword and then return a value. In this case, a number times itself. When we call this code after calling square num, nothing has changed. Let's comment out these codes so it doesn't confuse us for now. But if we set a variable, say squared number, to the return value of this function, and console log that, we get the value that we're expecting. Notice that this is a fu functional equivalent of saying this, but it also allows us to reuse this code and change the value. Compared to when we said 4 times 4 just a moment ago, when using a function like this, we only need to change the 1, instead of ch having to change both 4s. This is much cleaner and much easier to use in our code. It also makes it less prone to have errors. No matter what number we, we call the function with, it will return the value that we're expecting, as long as the logic inside of the function is true. This also easily allows us to use the, this functionality here in other files or in other programs simply by calling this. We don't need to worry about this logic ever again, unless we want to expand it. A few things to note about functions. Functions generally shouldn't be no longer than 20 lines of code, and should only do one thing. If, say in the square number, let's say in square number, then instead of just squaring our number, we also subtracted something. This now makes it kind of confusing as to what exactly the function is doing. It's squaring a number, but also subtracting a number. To keep your code cleaner, try to make sure that functions only do one thing. Usually a good test for this is by seeing when you're describing the function, whether or not you have to use the word AND. For example, in the square number function, it squares a number, but in this negative case, it squares 
and subtracts a number. It won't always be easy to make sure that your functions only do one thing, but do your best to do so. Next, let's talk about scope. Scope is the idea that certain values or variables are only accessible within certain levels of your code. For example, let's define a variable x that equals 10. And also, set a function, say add number, The variable that we defined, x, is on the global scope. This is the highest level of scope that we can have. n and m, n and m are on the function scope, or the scope of add numbers. This means that we can't have access to them outside of this function. We can test this by attempting to console log them. As you can see, we get an error, because n is not defined. But you may be thinking, n is defined here. Well, due to scopes, n cannot be seen outside of this function. n is only accessible between this curly brace and this curly brace. However, JavaScript is what is called lexically scoped, which means that the scopes cascade down. So we do have access to the global scope within the function. If we call add numbers, we can see that 10 is console logged. However, one thing to note is, if we define a variable x inside of our function, it will override the x in the global scope as far as the function is concerned, or this block of text here. As you can see when we call the function, it console logs 8. But in the global scope, x still equals 10. We can console log this and test x itself. As you can see in the global scope, when we call the variable x, it still equals 10. JavaScript has three levels of scope. Global scope, function scope, and block scope. Block scope means that things like if blocks have their own scope. We'll demonstrate this now. We would define a variable b and set it to 8 inside of the if block. If we attempt to console log b outside of the if block, our code will fail. Made an error and it didn't call a function. As you can see, our code has failed. b is not defined. If we want to use the value of b, we'll have to declare the variable outside of the scope of the if block. Now that we've done that, we have access to b in our scope. This works because of the lexical scoping that we talked about a moment ago. b is defined outside of the if block, but because of lexical scoping, it cascades down into the if block so we still have access to it. We then set it to 8, but since it still exists in the scope of the function, we can console log it. Next, let's talk about arrays. Arrays are a type of data structure. Arrays are a type of data structure. Data structures are simply a way that organizes pieces of our data, similar to objects. In JavaScript specifically, arrays are a special type of object. But rather than setting keys like we talked about in the previous video, the language itself 
or JavaScript sets these keys for us. These special keys are called indexes. These indexes reference positions that within the array. Indexes start at the position of 0 and increment by 1. The way we create an array is simply by using squared brackets. Within these squared brackets, we add a list of our values separated by commas. This array has five values, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. As I mentioned a moment ago, arrays start at 0. This is called 0 indexed. Essentially, the keys that we use are like this. Starting at 0, it increments by 1 for each position. So 0 is equivalent to 1 in our array. 1 is equivalent to 2 in our array. 2, 3, and so forth. This will be confusing at first, but you'll eventually get used to it. To access these values, we simply give the name of the array, followed by brackets, much like following a f uh, calling a function, and then we put the index that we want to get the value for. In this case, we want to get the value of 1 at the index of 0. So within the brackets, we put 0. As you can see, we've console logged 1. When we put 1, we get 2. When we put 3, we get 4. It is also possible to nest objects or more arrays inside of itself, much like we talked about with objects. In the example of an array, if we want to get access to the internal values, we simply put another pair of brackets and then put the index that we want to have access for. As you can see, I failed to change the index to, f to 4. We now get A. This section of code here is equivalent to this. We're simply just getting this array out of the array. When we console log it, we can see that it is, it is the same. Nothing special is going on here. We'll change this back now. There is a problem that we have. It'd be very cumbersome to have to type out every single index. Like so. This would become very time consuming and locks us in to the amount of positions that we've defined by hand. But in code, we don't always necessarily know how long our array is, and our arrays could potentially be millions of, of elements long. This is where loops come in. Loops are a structure, much like an if block, that repeat a certain section of code until a certain condition is met. There are a few types of loops. First, we'll go over a for loop. There are three elements of a for loop. A counter, a comparison, and an incrementer.
They're also separated by semicolons rather than commas. For a counter, we commonly use i. In this example, we'll set i to 0. We'll say we'll loop as long as i is less than 5. And for the incrementer, we'll say i plus plus, which will add 1 every time the loop completes. i is simply just a variable that equals a number, so we can use it as an index for our array. As you can see, when we run our code, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. But we only have this console log once. This is because the array runs 5 times, due to it saying i being less than 1. We can check the value of i on every iteration. To make this cleaner, let's console let's comment out the console log for the array. On the first iteration, i is equal to 0. On the second, i is equal to 1. This continues until i is equal to 4. This is because it stops at 5. When using less than or greater than, it, it is up to not including the number you're comparing against. If you wanted to include the number we are comparing against, we would use an equals operator, or a greater than or equals operator, or less than or equals operator. As you can see, it now includes 5. Let's change this back. We still have a problem, though. What if our array what if our array has an, an additional value added? Or two values added? This still breaks our array. This still breaks our loop as we only get five values out of it. Well, to fix this, we can use our array dot length. This gets the total length of our array, or seven. Now when we run it, we get all the values from our array. Something else that we could do is get the length of the, the array outside of the loop if it becomes too unclean to put inside and then substitute the variable that i is comparing against or the value that i is comparing against with the array that is set to our length this could actually be a much better way to do it because in this case because in this case We've already set the value, and the loop is not having to check this function every single time. This can save on code ex execution time, as the value is already calculated before the loop starts. One last thing to keep in mind about loops. If you put a loop within a loop, like so, Let's change this, this variable name to be a little bit cleaner. 
though it doesn't really matter because of scoping. When we nest these loops, the inner loop will do its loops for every time that the outer loop executes. When we wrote, run this code, we can see that when we display the one in the outer loop, the inner loop runs 10 times. When we display the two in the outer loop, the inner loop runs 10 times. When we display three, 10 times as well. This goes on. This can be a big problem. As if this array here is thousands of elements long, we'd have to run 10 times for every single element. That would be tens of thousands of times this loop would run. If there's really complicated code inside of this loop, it could take a very long time to complete. This is why you have to be careful putting loops within loops. Sometimes you'll have to, but see if there's another option that you can use before that. Before we go, we'll cover one more type of loop. This is a while loop. A while loop simply runs until a conditional is false. In this case, it will run indefinitely because true never becomes false. But we can put any conditional that we want in here. For example, if we have a variable x, as long as x is less than 10, the while loop will run. This is similar to when we have i is less than value except we'll have to put the incrementer inside the while loop. When we run our code now, we can see that ran is printed 10 times. Be careful with while loops because they're very easy to create an infinite loop, which will cause your program to crash. Thank you. In the next video, we'll be covering basics of object-oriented, interfaces, and APIs.